Greetings, everyone, and welcome to No BS Baking. You got JP here. Now, today I want to talk about the importance of and how to determine a base hydration plan. Now, you guys have heard me over and over again talking about establishing a base hydration based on the flour and the product you're making, and then balancing this hydration with the ingredients you add. Now, this is probably the least talked about and least understood aspect of bread making at the home baking level, but it's standard procedure for baking in R&D professionals. So anyway, hydration is always based as a percentage of flour. So if you have one kg plan for baking, then you're gonna need a certain amount of liquid to make the type of product that you want. Now, as an example, you're using all purpose flour to make white sandwich bread. Then the flour is 100%. So 60% hydration in this example would be 600 milliliters grams if you prefer. As explained in my video on Baker's Percent, the mathematics are simple and easiest to understand as ratio and proportion. And in case you need a refresher, you can check out this video in my archive. R&D and baking professionals all know everything begins from a base or control start point. Industry guidelines provide a solid foundation for testing a recipe and then it becomes a matter of where you want to take it from there. Rarely will you ever see a professional baker arbitrarily grab an online third-party recipe and just go for it and make it, like home bakers do. They will evaluate it by percentage, and more often than not adjust it based on their ingredients, baking conditions, and knowledge. Bakers know from the get-go that their flour is most probably going to be different. They know their water may be different. High pH, like many places in Europe, excessively hard or soft water in their area, or even chlorine content it may contain. Salt and yeast can vary significantly from recipe to recipe. In most cases, bakers will completely ignore these quantities, opting to start at long-established industry guidelines that you can see used by professional chefs and bakers around the world. When I'm talking about total hydration, I'm talking about all the water in the dough. All the ingredients containing water need to be factored, including butter, when used at levels above 10%. Now this becomes especially important in pastry where often butter is a significant contributor to the overall dough hydration. Now I've shown many examples of problematic recipes I found online in many of my videos. Unfortunately, they are everywhere. If I never actually looked at and evaluated the recipe in weights and percentages, I could have just spent two hours making bread pancakes. So you want to make a product that you see online and you want to be successful. So what do you do? Do you just follow the recipe and hope for the best? Or do you go scurrying around the internet trying to find a different recipe or recipes to see what others are doing? Or do you pull the recipe down, evaluate it in the recipe manager, and then modify it with the correct start points as listed in the guide? I say the answer is pretty straightforward. One of the biggest issues I have with third-party recipes is the huge variation in recipe balance and processes. Now, I know that everyone has their way of making their product. However, the problem is when you are not adhering to or provide proper industry standards with respect to salt, yeast, dough temperature, and hydration, these recipe authors can be unwittingly setting you up to fail. And I'm sure we've all had our experience with a recipe just would not work or the product just didn't look like it was supposed to. But I will admit, for those proud enough or bold enough to actually show the product that you can expect from the recipe, well, at least you can decide. I mean, if it's the type of product you want to bake, then at least you see how the professionals do it. This is why there's industry standards, and this is why professional bakers rarely fail making new items. These standards I'm talking about are not just loosely put together ideas or silly parroted baking myths on the right way to bake. They are long established standards based on over 100 years of research and scientific testing that hold true to this day. So with all the different bread product types and vast variations of each of them, 
How do bakers know what hydration to use and how do they pick a start point? The answer is science. Hydration capacities of flour types based on species, protein and starch quality and content, milling technology used, and flour testing as in the case of farina graph curves as one example. Through extensive testing and research, foundational or base hydration levels were established, which were then expanded to cover a variety of products and the specific characteristics bakers desired. Now, subsequently, experiments were conducted on time, temperature, dough development processes, and equipment, leading to the creation of optimized methods for a wide range of hydration levels and product types. So you decided on a light multigrain bread. You checked a guide and for multigrain bread with 20% or less grains, it said 65% is a good hydration start point. Now, ideally, you want the grains at least to be hydrated to the same hydration of your dough. If your grains are hydrated to less than that of the dough, they will leach water from the dough itself in efforts of attaining a hydration balance within the product. This action, combined with natural moisture migration from the crumb to the crust and then out into the air, commonly called staling, can dramatically reduce the eating quality and overall shelf life of your product. Hydration planning may not perfectly balance the absorption of all ingredients in the dough due to varying absorption rates and capacities. However, it sets up your recipe for a successful bake, providing a basis for fine-tuning as needed. This is where the dry ingredient and soaking calculators work so well. Feel comfortable knowing that when you add things like milk powder, soy flour, non-gluten flours for nutrition and enrichment, or pre-soaked grains or seeds and the like for that nice hearty texture, that you maintain a balanced and common sense working hydration for ensuring enough dough strength, good handling properties, and optimum baking performance. Now, as mentioned, grains, seeds, nuts, etc., all have varying hydration capacities and rates. Understanding these not only helps you determine which grains will work with your hydration plan, but as importantly, identify those that require more hydration than the dough plan to minimize equilibrium issues after baking. Now, as we discussed, knowing hydration capacities for grains and other ingredients is important. In most instances, you do not want 100% hydration. As you can see from these two examples of multigrain bread, the example on the right ensured the grains had enough integrity to remain as an integral part of the product's look and appeal. While the loaf on the right, the grains were simply lost in the dough during mixing. Hydration plan is more about establishing and working a hydration start point to ensure the recipe produces an acceptable controlled product. This process is by no means the end of the journey for the recipe, only the first phase of building the perfect product. Water absorption capacity is different for each ingredient as they absorb water at often quite different rates and amounts. The amount of water available also determines how much each ingredient will absorb. This is determined by their absorption capacities and rates. As mentioned, given enough time, the ingredient hydrations will balance within the product. But this time, and pending the ingredient, could take much longer than a standard same-day baking process. And temperature. Higher water temperatures coupled with agitation can influence the rate at which water is absorbed. So with salt, yeast of industry standards, and proper hydration base for the flour you're using, and a proper final dough temperature, you can almost guarantee a successful bake. The trick now is to make notes and methodically plan the minor adjustments for your next bake. This is how the R&D guys do it. If you think about it, it's just common sense. Some ingredients commonly used in baking are classified as highly hygroscopic, such as salt, sugar, syrups, molasses, powdered milk. As the level of sweeteners added is increased above 5%, then water should be increased. Milk powder contains lactose, which is highly hygroscopic, 
So if adding above 5% to your dough, then water will require a minor adjustment. Salt is set at a base control standard of 2%. So if you're using less than 1.5%, a reduction in water should be made. If above 2%, then a slight increase in hydration is common. Similarly, if butter or fats are used at levels above 15%, then one may need to consider the water it's contributing. Now, butter, as an example, could contain 15 to 20% water by weight. So if using it at this level or higher, then a minor water reduction may be required. Additionally, fats at levels above 10% start to interfere with both mixing effectiveness and the gluten's ability to absorb water due to the slippery and water repelling properties of the fats. Therefore, extended mix time may be required for ensuring this free water is able to be picked up by the gluten. And lastly, I know I continue to repeat myself because it's so important. Final dough temperature of 74 to 78 or 23 to 25 degrees Celsius is a well-known baking standard. It is critical for recipe and fermentation balance and should be strictly adhered to. Likewise, salt plays an important function in dough rheology, providing strength and tightening effect on gluten. Therefore, all these hydration star point recommendations are based on a global standard of 2% salt in the dough. Yes, you can try reducing in future trials of sodium reduction as your goal, but feel it out and move cautiously, as the dough can dramatically change, becoming soft and sticky as salt is reduced in the recipe, requiring potential hydration and other recipe changes to avoid disaster. And get your yeast in line by establishing the ideal amount to use based on assuring a proper final dough temperature. You want your yeast to deliver a one hour double in size rest and a final proof in slightly warmer environment and around the same time. I do a lot of cross checking information on the internet, looking at baking websites, industry technical resources, and even YouTube to see what folks are doing or recommending to their viewers. There is so much conflicting information out there, some pretty good, others are not even close. Now, I have a pretty good idea of what I expect the answer should look like, yet I have literally spent hours trying to locate information that provides some semblance of consistency. Ten different sites saying or demonstrating ten different things. Finally, if you haven't already, I highly recommend you get the Baking Assistant. The latest module is all about understanding the importance of hydration, how and why it all works, and how not planning can cause you grief when making a new product. Now this is so important for producing a successful product that you can build on it and get it just the way you like it. The Baking Assistant is the best 30 bucks you will ever spend. Get it, you will not be disappointed.